I want to start by asking you to, let's think about this. Half of the homes that will be around in 40 years do not exist today around the world. You know, today we got about 3.5 billion people. Within the lifetime of our children, we're going to go to 7 billion. And it could be very nice and very civilized. Of course, we're going to have to be denser. You know, it would be ideal if all of the growth that Markham and the York region and the GTA is within the existing footprint. I mean, and density doesn't mean that we're going to have those four horrible 40 story buildings. We can get the exactly same density with five or six story buildings next to each other than with 40 story buildings every other block. We just need to decide how it is. So this afternoon, I want, I want you to think, how do we want to live? Canada's population is also going to grow by 7 million people. 7 million people is the same population as the five largest cities. Let's assume we've got to do a, a new Toronto, Montreal, Calgary, Ottawa, Edmonton in the next 30 years. And all of this is urban. All of the population growth in Canada is going to be urban. Almost 9 out of 10 people today already live in urban areas in Canada. And that's going to continue to be the trend. The gr population growth in Canada is like doing 20 Markhams in 30 years. It's like doing six York regions. I mean, the extended GTA, I would say the, the, the best thing that has happened in the extended GTA in the last 50 years is the places to grow plant that put a limit. Said so here, everybody has to grow within this existing footprint. Otherwise, we'd be doomed. I mean, if we have dense cities, sooner or later, everything is going to work. If we continue to sprawl, nothing is going to work. Mobility is not going to work, public health is not going to work, economic development, nothing is going to work. I mean, in the GTA, one out of three homes that we'll have within the lifetime of our children do not exist today. So it's a great opportunity, but also a huge responsibility, because whatever we do or don't do is how millions in the GTA, how billions around the world are going to live for hundreds of years. So if this is going to happen in the next 30 or 40 years, let's see what we have done in the last 40. Because if what we've been doing is good, okay, let's just do more of the same. Unfortunately, this is how we've been doing cities around the world. Absolutely horrible. We've been segregating, sending the poor people to the worst places where there are no jobs, there is no mobility, there is no public spaces. One of the issues, like I was talking to some of you before we started and said one of the issues, big issues in Markham is housing. One of the problems is that housing around the world, we have thought of it as a supply and demand issue. And supply and demand issue works very well where there is supply and there is demand. If I'm making water bottles and I charge too much money, someone is going to make water bottles and charge less and the price comes down. But the land is fixed. It doesn't matter how much demand there is, there's not going to be more supply. So as long as we allow this just a supply and demand, it's not going to work anywhere. In Markham, or in Toronto, or in Vancouver, or in Mumbai, or Copenhagen, or anywhere. We need government intervention in the issue of the land. Otherwise, we're going to continue. I mean, look at things like it, the U.S. is the wealthiest country in the world. And in the wealthiest country, this is the life expectancy by postal code. How can we accept the areas, the postal codes in dark red, the life expectancy is 60. In light pink, is 90. How can we even accept that this is normal? That the people that happen by luck to be born in one part of our city, they're going to live to 60. If by luck in another, to 90. Fortunately, in Canada, we're not as bad as in the US in this segregation. But we are clearly moving in that direction. This is totally irrational. That just within a few minutes, it's like if you were living in a different continent. In the last 80 years, we've been focusing on cars, 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 and not on people's happiness. And this is the kind of cities that we've been building. We have not even solved mobility, investing these billions and billions into these highways. There is no city in the world 
none. The size of the GTA or Markham that has solved the issue of mobility through the private car, none. And everyone has tried in the last 80 years. So if that was an option, we would have hundreds of examples. Unfortunately, many of the emerging countries, China, Russia, Brazil, they are doing exactly the same things. You know, after this is all of Florence, Italy, and a highway interception at the same scale. It seems like all of a sudden, after thousands of years, we learn how to do cities, and then we unlearned. By the way, cities, they don't decide the what. You know, how much population, that's more something at the national level. But the cities do decide the how. Is the, this is how we've been doing cities in the last 40 years. There are no trees, no parks. Instead of parks, we're doing parkings. <laughs> Imagine a little child, an elderly person, someone with disabilities. They become as, like a slave to someone with a car just to go out for an ice cream. So the last 40 years, the overwhelming majority is horrible. Some of it is poor. Very, very few, like with acupuncture, is good. So we'll have to do cities radically different. A few days ago, I was in Mississauga, and I said, okay, tell me, what is the best, I was asking the planners of Mississauga and some elected officials, what is the best part of Mississauga? They said, oh, one, oh it's poor credit. Someone said, oh, it's Streetsville. Someone said, oh, you know, it's Clarkson. I said, yeah, you know, but you had nothing to do with that. That was done 100 years ago. Your only credit is that you haven't messed it up. Same thing in Oakville. I was talking to them. I said, oh, Gil, you got to come see our downtown Oakville. I said, yeah, but again, that was done 100 years ago. If we knew that downtown Oakville was so amazing, why is it that they didn't do another downtown Oakville as it grew from 40,000 people to 200,000? Or as Mississauga grew from 200,000 to 800,000? I mean, we need to improve the cities that we have today, but we also gotta create great cities for many more people. I mean, we gotta put it into context. It doesn't matter if the city is 2,000 people or half a million or 10 million. The issues are the same. We're living longer in the city of 2,000. We're living longer in the city of 10 million. We need public transit in the city of 2,000. We need public transit in the city of 10 million. So the issues are similar. The solution is different. We got a public health crisis, physical, mental, emotion. The population is growing. We got climate change. I mean, we see climate change everywhere, even if some people don't want to believe in it. Yeah. It's amazing. Yesterday, over 6 million people voted for political parties that are not in favor of any real solution to climate change. What does climate change have to do with city? Look, this is Chicago. The blue is the downtown. Look at the impact of dense cities against sprawl. As you start sprawling, it becomes totally a huge problem for climate change. So having density is a big part of the solution of climate change. Because it's very different to have 1,000 people living in 20 buildings than the same 1,000 living in 500 homes spread out where we need to bring the water and the sewage and the jobs and the mobility and so on. We're living longer, not just in Markham. <laughs> you know, this is really interesting everywhere. You know, this is the life expectancy. All the circles are all the countries in the world. You know, human beings, we've been around for 200,000 years. In just 200 years ago, we didn't have any country with a life expectancy above 45. None. So many of us will be dead by now. <laughs> In only 200 years, we went from no country having a life expectancy above 45 to no country having a life expectancy below 45. Any engineers in the room? You know, when you talk about cities, the engineers are very shy. <laughs> You know, this is, in a big part, it's thanks to the engineers. Thanks to the engineers. Why? Clean water, sewage, and then the public health vaccination. 
Those three elements. So we're gonna thank the engineers. Also, not the engineers, the new engineers have a new mentality on creating cities for people. But it was because of that, water, sewage, and vaccination. So when people are against vaccination, show them this. You know, that's, that's vaccination. I mean, the people over 60, today we got about 960 million people. In the next 30 years, it's gonna more than double. So when you say, oh, in Markham we have a lot of older people, well, you're gonna have many more. And that's great. All of this, how do we want to live? We need to recreate the cities and recreating for people because many cities have been thought of just for cars. And there are some ingredients here, like you are gonna do a pasta, you boil water, you put on the pasta, but if it's only water, it's gonna be a spiceless pasta. People don't like spiceless pasta, so your friends, either you get spices or they're gonna go somewhere else. So you get the ingredients and you get a better pasta. The cities also have ingredients, such as the parks and the public spaces and the walking. Those are the spices. We gotta create in Markham a spice city, not a spiceless city. People don't wanna live in spiceless cities. Let me give you an example. It's not an issue of money. If you, if you, this, if you, if you don't know anybody and you come to this city, are you gonna go meet friends in that street? <laughs> Probably not. And that building has won a lot of architectural awards. That doesn't mean that it works, it's horrible. That's spiceless, this is spiced. It's very clear. Sometimes some faith groups, they have areas where they are used for a few hours a week. Others are used 24 seven. Again, it's not about the money. This park costs a lot of money. What do you do here? Nothing. You come here, you take some photos, you never go back because there is nothing to do. This one costs very little money and people come over and over and over because there are tons of things to do. So what is the Markham that you wanna become? That is the big question. So this afternoon, I'm gonna talk about sustainable mobility. By the way, walking and cycling is not a joke. So we say, oh, oh Gil, but it's Markham, we have money, we don't walk. We're, well, you know, this could be Markham anywhere. Walking and cycling is not a frivolity. Even this little girl knows it. <laughs> you know, walking and cycling is the only individual mode of mobility for most people, even in Markham. It's the only individual mode of mobility for all children and youth. If you're under 16, your only individual mode of mobility is to walk or to bike. You might be the son or the daughter of the wealthiest person in Markham. So having, being able to walk and ride bicycles safe should be almost like a human right. Unless you think that only the people that have the money and the age and the desire to have a car have a right to individual mobility. That's why today we're also talking about democracy and human rights and equality and sustainability because everything is really linked together. But obviously I'm not gonna talk just about mobility. I'm gonna talk about urban parks and public spaces. The sustainable mobility because we need to get to those public spaces. You know, Detroit, Detroit is going through a huge revitalization. You know, Detroit had two million people 40 years ago. Now they got 600,000. Some of the things they're doing is doing parks in the heart of the city. Malmo is a city the size of Markham. Malmo, they lost half of their jobs in two years. They went to South Korea, they were shipyards, and look what they did, they started doing beautiful public spaces and then all the urban area, and then the buildings. Sometimes are parks in the middle of the city, like Piedmont, sometimes they are elevated, sometimes like the beam, sometimes it's along the water, and the river, the Mississippi River, magnificent. And the things we do in parks is great, in the public spaces. I was in the last World Soccer Cup, I was working sometimes in the US, I would go to the parks to see the games, and that's what they were doing in South Korea, and in Bogota, and in Germany. But it's not just about sports. The Hong Kong and the Umbrella Revolution, it was in the parks and in the public spaces. Occupy Wall Street, Jesuit Charlie. You know, the public places are magnificent equalizers. Everybody's equal. No one knows who's rich, who's poor, who's fat, who's skinny. No one cares. But it's not just about sports or politics. This is two million people in Rio. It wasn't during the World Cup. It was when the Pope came to Rio and had a mass for two million people. And it doesn't have to be a big place, sometimes it's just a small stair. This guy in Rio is making sure everybody pays attention. 
Imagine from this point of view of citizen engagement, you get 130 steps, you get 130 families or small business painting one step, putting their initials. Imagine the sense of belonging. You know, I was working in January in Alaska, people ice fishing. That's why sometimes people say, Gil, what's a nice city? This is about how do we want to live. I said, a good city is one where I want to sleep at home, but I want to live outside. I wanna, that's the power of the public spaces. We all will want to live. So I want to take you through eight messages. And then once we finish with the eight messages, we can have some questions. The first one is that it's not about the money. People always say, oh, we don't have money for the park. We don't have money for the sidewalk. No, it's not about the money. Before coming to Canada, now I'm based in Toronto. I was commissioner in Bogota. And I learned that it wasn't about the money. Now I advise many cities, but before I was doing for example, we built over 200 parks in one term, all over the city, small ones, big ones. This was one of them. The Pope came here, gave a mass for a million people, then the Pope left, and nothing happened in 27 years. Why nothing happened? Because change is hard. Change is hard in Markham, change is hard in Bogota, in Copenhagen, in Paris, everywhere. Because you try to change in Markham, and the cave people show up. <coughs> You know them, they are everywhere. They are the citizens against virtually everything. <laughs> That's why you should not take no for an answer. I mean, you gotta find the solution to the problem. I mean, we have fantastic planners, and the planners must realize that their job doesn't end with doing a nice drawing. It's how to get that implemented, how to find that little crack through the window and run through it and actually do it. That's why it was like this for 27 years, and in four years we turned it into the nicest park for active, for passive, for contemplative recreation, for things that people can do at their own pace and at their own time. And it's not just about soccer fields, it's about also passive, being able to sit or do activities with the groups and friends. So I want to talk a lot more about the uses and the activities because this is what is really critical, critical to make those public places work. And it's a park that is very well used. Something else that I did is I found a small program called Ciclovia of a few kilometers and a few thousand people, and we turned it into the world's largest pop-up park. It's really simple, do it in Markham. How do we do it? Open streets to people, close them to cars, and the magic happens. People come out to walk and bike and skate and run. We do 121 kilometers all over the city, totally interconnected. And we get young and old and rich and poor, fat, skinny. It's everybody. But not everybody wants to walk or bike or skate. So along the road, we do aerobics or tai chi or cha-cha-cha, whatever it takes. But the umbrella is physical activity. And this is something that anybody can do. I mean, you can say, OK, Mark, and we're going to do it next year. We're going to do it from May to September, the first Sunday of every month. Let's start with one. What is the risk? Nothing. You got the streets. You are not going to do arenas or gymnasium. It's just open them to people. If it doesn't work, OK, then you don't do it again in 2021. But if it works, then you do it weekly from May to September or May to October. You are going to get young and old and rich and poor. You know, in Bogota, we get one out of four people in the city come out every single Sunday of the year plus holidays. And why is this important? Because it changes minds. All of a sudden, everybody, the people that drive cars, that do not drive cars, everybody is going to be reminded that streets are public space. They belong to everybody. Young, old, rich, poor. I mean, City of Angels and Car now is doing it monthly, and now they're gonna go into, we're working with Mayor Garcetti to make it go into weekly. New York, Portland. I mean, this is about social integration. You got such diversity in Markham, but how to get people together? When I started promoting this in India about 10 or 12 years ago, they didn't have any. Now they got 50 cities in India doing it every week. And cities of 50,000, of 100,000, of a million, 10 million, it works. Who would have thought this is Brownsville or San Jose? 50,000 cars on a Friday, people on bikes and walking on a Sundays. This is very different from a marathon, because on the marathon, you need to be in shape, you need to train. You know, you can go for 10 minutes or for one hour. You can do 20 minutes and rest. And something that is beautiful is that you meet people as equals. All, 
Think about where are the places where the, you, you have so many main corporations now in Markham. Where do the CEOs of those large corporations and their minimum wage workers cleaning floors of those large corporations, where do they meet as equals? This is a magnificent place to meet as equals. That's why now over 300 cities are doing it. Something else we did, 280 kilometers of protected bikeways. In three years, from nothing, when there was not a, a centimeter from Alaska to the Patagonia, and went from a few thousand to half a million cycling, and always like along the, rain, the, the drainage canals, and on the streets, and really important, creating a network. Net connectivity is important. In some of these neighborhoods, it was so poor that it's almost impossible to imagine in Markham the level of poverty in these neighborhoods. And why do we need to have really good quality bikeways and sidewalks, as well as trees and lights? Part of it is because it's going to be safer, but just as important because we need to dignify the people that walk. We digni need to dignify the people that ride bicycles. We need to dignify the people that are poor. By the way, when I say it's not an issue of money, of course, it's an issue of priorities. As you can see, the street on the left doesn't have any pavement. And we said, well, a future administration will take care of it. <laughs> and it's something that it was very, very well done. And it's about being consistent. And when I'm talking, you know, the, the physical separation is critical. When I come to Markham, I see that you are starting to paint some bike lanes on some roads. If you don't have a physical separation, it's not going to work. You need to, I mean, it works if you are in a small neighborhood street where the speed limit is less than 30K. But when you are on Highway 7 and you don't have a physical separation, it doesn't work. When the cars are going by at 40, 50, 60, 70. And also, we need networks. And this is a network that is really critical. And this is something that is totally doable anywhere. And then it clicks. Now the city has over 500 kilometers, almost a million people riding, over 200,000 are women. And when I'm talking today about people walking, I'm talking about anybody that moves at the speed of the pedestrian. By the way, one of my brothers is mayor as of three years ago. And when he began, he was mayor 20 years ago, and he was talking about the BRT, the bus rapid transit, which you have here, the Viva. People said, what? It's like a subway, but above ground? Well, this is what the transportation system, quote unquote, used to look like. The first line, from idea to implementation, took 36 months. And this line moves more people than 90% of the subways of the world. By the way, all of us, the people in Toronto, in Markham, in Winnipeg, in Vancouver, were paying for a one-stop subway. <laughs> over $4 billion in a low density. This could easily move the population that is going to be in Scarborough for the next 200 years. But people are obsessed because some mayor came with subway, 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 and be became like a parrot, just repeating subway, subway, subway. Uh, and the issue is that we need citywide systems. If we don't have systems. But then this is what is being done. And in addition, they just inaugurated to some of the poorest neighborhoods in the mountains uh, with these cable cars and other things. They have a tender open right now to get the feeder buses. The feeder buses, because the BRT is kind of like the spinal cord. But you need fee to feed people into the spinal cord. Then 600 electric buses are coming on board. And also, some of these buses were like 12 years old, they had over 2 million kilometers. Obviously, they were a big issue. Now, they have replaced all of those of Euro 2 and 3 for Euro 6 and 7. What is the difference? That this is the impact on, on the pollution when it's Euro 1 or 2 as opposed to 5 or 6. So it, it's, it's about improving some of this. In this month, in this semester, over 1,400 new buses. Half of them two bodies, half of them three bodies are coming in. And it's interesting. But let's pass the page from Bogota. Let's talk about creating 880 cities. I've been very lucky. I'm the founder and chair of 880 cities. And I also was chair of World Urban Parks and now ambassador. And I've been lucky to have worked in over more than 350 different uh, cities. 
Last week I was working, working in Moscow and Kazan. I arrived yesterday. The week before that I worked in Nairobi, Kenya. The week before that in Dar es Salaam, Tanzania. Next week in North Dakota in the US. Some cities bigger than Markham, some cities smaller than Markham. Water Urban Parks is something that I hope that Markham becomes a member because basically Water Urban Parks, we think that everybody should have quality parks in the everywhere. And it's a place where we exchange information from places from all over. And we have an academy through Indiana University. And we have regional congresses, like in Mexico or in the US. And we have world congresses. We had a world congress in Melbourne two years ago. We had one in Kazan uh, last week. We're going to have next year in Tirana. Anybody have ever heard of Tirana? You know, Tirana is the capital of Albania, which used to be the North Korea of Europe. They have a fantastic mayor. In the last five years, they have transformed this city into a city around children. A really fantastic one. And then the year after that is going to be Guadalajara and their advocacy committees, such as Children Play and Nature, or their adults, or large parks, or healthy parks. If you want any more information, that's the website, waterbrandparks.org. But everywhere I go, people say, Gil, what's 880 cities? Well, it's 8280, it's 880. What is that? Well, 880 cities is not really about parks or streets or walking or cycling. Those are the means, not the end. The end is how can we create vibrant and healthy cities? You know, I like to go and see the venue the day before, if not possible. Like this morning, I came early to see the venue. The other day, I was going to speak in Warsaw. And I was going to speak outdoors, so I went the day before, and I see all of these people dancing. And I say, oh my god, how am I going to compete with them the next day? And then I saw the DJ, DJ Vika. <laughs> <laughs> I told you, we're living longer. She's a businesswoman. She goes from park to park. She owns the equipment, the musical, and she organizes the dances. So that is the idea of 880 cities, cities where we're going to have vibrant, they're going to be successful, but also it's going to have healthy communities, and people are going to live happier. And always people say, oh, Gil, but can my children walk to school? Can my grandparents or great-great-grandparents ride their bike to get eggs or milk? Look, you don't need to be a transportation engineer. We call it 880 rule of common sense. Unfortunately, common sense seems to be the least common of the senses. <laughs> Step number one, think of an 80-year-old an that you love. It can be your son, your daughter, your grandchild, anyone. Everybody has someone in mind. Step number two, think of an 80-year-old that you love, your parents, your grandparents, your brothers, your sisters. Once you have the child and the older adult, then go to step number three. Would you send them walking to the park? Would you send them walking to take the Viva Transit? Would you send them riding their bike to get eggs or milk? Would they feel safe? If you would, it's because it's safe enough. If you would not, it's because it's not, and we gotta do it better. What if everything that you did in Markham, everything, the libraries, the sidewalks, the schools, the street, the crosswalk, the restaurant, everything had to be great for an eight and an 80. It's not a two eighties, eight and eighty as an indicator species. Because if it's good for the eight and it's good for the eighty, it's gonna be good for everybody from zero to over a hundred. We need to stop building cities as if everybody was 30 years old and athletic. And build great cities for all. And that is the concept of 880 cities. Third, let's move on sustainable mobility. When I'm talking about sustainable mobility, I'm thinking about walking and riding bicycles and using public transit and new uses of cars. By the way, who came walking today? One, two, three, four. You know, I don't see any cars in this room or buses or bicycles, so I guess everyone came walking because every single tree begins and ends walking. Sometimes people say, oh, I'm not a walker. Of course you are a walker. We walk to the car, we walk to public transit, we walk to places, everybody walks. You know, that's how we were created. And it makes us so happy to be walkers. You know, it's, it's just like the birds, they fly, or the fish swims. People, we walk. That's how we were created in the middle of the storm with babies and all, we walk. You know, the other day, I Googled, I said, walking. And in walking, I get all of this. You know, it's like if it was Lululemon, you know, you need Lululemon to walk around. No, you don't need Lululemon. <laughs> Everybody walks. You know, and I, the more that I think about it, I have a, the first grandchild I have, and he still doesn't walk. He doesn't want to walk. He loves crawling. But one day, 
he's going to stop looking at the floor and he's going to walk. And I'm waiting for my daughter to call me and say, Dad, Emilio walked. And that will transform his life forever to the day he stopped living. It's amazing. And maybe it's because when we walk, we use all our senses. We're walking and we see the children playing. We see the youth in South Africa going to school. We hear the birds singing. You know, we go in front of a coffee shop and we smell the aroma. Parents and children walk, older adults walk. We walk in the summer, we walk in the winter, but we need to make it safe, safe. And it is not safe. Yesterday, people driving cars killed 741 people walking. That's more than a person every two minutes. Imagine. You know, a few months ago, two planes crashed and everybody died. Two planes. And what happened? Around the world, all of the 737s were grounded. They've been grounded for months. And they're going to be con continued. They've been grounded for many more months. Well, every single day, the equivalent of five 737s are the people walking that are killed. Five. Imagine that one plane was over Markham, one over Russia, one over Australia, one over Brazil, one over the U.S., full of people, and they crashed, and everybody dies. One day, and the next day, another five, and the next day, my God. And they're not accidents. Accidents when they could not be avoided. They're incidents because they can be avoided. That's why now some cities are adopting Vision Zero. Vision Zero says people are not perfect. The people walking or the people driving. Vision Zero says no one should die on the streets. Whether they're walking or on cars or on transit or on bicycle, no one should be dying. But then some cities, like your friends to the south, they don't put the money or the actions, and then it's not vision zero, it's zero vision. Because it's not just about adopting, oh, we're a vision zero city. No, we gotta have complete streets. We need to have a commitment that is gonna be safe to, we're gonna have nature, and we're gonna have walking, and we're gonna have cycling, and we're gonna have public transit. I mean, when I was saying about vision zero, we know all over the GTA, every single, it's not just Toronto, it's also Markham, York, we see it's Peel, it's all over the place. We keep hearing all these people being hit by drivers. And they say, oh, a, a car struck a pedestrian. No, cars don't strike anybody. It's a driver using a car. You know, if someone on a bicycle, they don't say, oh, bicycle struck a pedestrian. No, they say a cyclist is the person. I mean, even the language, all of a sudden, it, it seems kind of crazy. With one rainy day in the GTA, 16 pedestrians are hit by cars. And then they interview the chief of police and say, oh, you know, it's that time of the year. What? <laughs> Is there a time of the year when pedestrians are being hit by cars? How stupid. I mean, we, we don't need safe streets for 10 o'clock in the morning, Sunday, in the middle of the summer, when there are no cars. No, we need it is for that time of the year. That is on another rainy day, another 12 plus four in York and Peel. I mean, in Toronto, a person driving hits a person walking every three and a half hours. And I don't hear any counselor that has the issue of pedestrian safety as one of the top three priorities. None. And the mayor doesn't put any money into it. The other day, the mayor went to a school and made a school safe around and said, and we won't stop until we're finished. We're going to do 20 schools per year. And everybody clapped. Well, mayor, if you do 20 schools per year, it's going to take you 31 years to do the elementary schools. It's going to take you 51 years to do elementary and secondary schools. I mean, we need to have all of the schools safe within two years, not within 31 years. I mean, we know what needs to be done. If we want to, we need to make walking a priority, and it's not a priority when we have all kinds of barriers. You know, the other day I was in Miami, and I was talking with the mayor of Miami and his, some of his counselors, and when they saw that, they were laughing until I said, Mayor, that's Miami. <laughs> I mean, we should not allow cars on the sidewalks. You know, the other day, a few weeks ago, I was in Albuquerque, and brand new sidewalks in Albuquerque. And I said, oh, nice, you put lights to the pedestrians. But not nice that you put the post in the middle of the sidewalk. <laughs> brand new sidewalks on the neighborhoods, and they put all of these barriers. Look at this, it looked like a roller coaster. 
Who's going to walk there? And they said, the, the city manager said, Gil, but it meets the standards. I said, I'm not talking about standards. If, if that is the standard, it's a stupid standard. <laughs> I mean, shouldn't it be normal? Is the sidewalk perfectly flat? Shouldn't the car going in or out once a day, the one going up and down and not the pedestrian? I mean, think of people with disabilities. And some of you might say, oh, but I don't have a disability. You know, people with disabilities is the largest minority and one where any one of us can be a part any time. You know, if you're not Hispanic, you're not gonna wake up tomorrow Hispanic. But if I don't have a disability, and I trip going out here, and I break my leg, tomorrow I'm gonna be on a wheelchair. Imagine going on a wheelchair on this sidewalk. Also, they got other things, like brand new bike lanes where the cyclists protect the parked cars, and not the parked cars protecting the cyclists. And in so many places where we don't even do sidewalks. Did you know that in Toronto, 26 out of 100 streets don't have sidewalk? One out of four. One out of four. I mean, we're telling this woman every single day, you are a second class citizen where we don't even do the sidewalks. That's Toronto, you know, the sidewalks. I mean, there is nothing as important in Markham or anywhere than the sidewalks. Because the sidewalks are very different. When you're on the street, whether you are on a bicycle, on transit, or on car, you are going from point A to point B. Not on the sidewalks. On the sidewalks, people meet boyfriends and girlfriends. You meet your neighbors. You chat with people that have dogs. You get to meet the people selling coffee and fruits and vegetables. I mean, we socialize. All of us, and we say, oh, I'm going to go for a coffee. And I take one hour. I go and sit and watch people, get their coffee, chat with somebody. I mean, that, that's the life. When we go to any city, first thing we do, we put the bags, and then we go out walking. You know, we, we are on the sidewalks in the summertime. We are in the wintertime. The children catch Pokemons on the sidewalks. Others catch public transit. The sidewalks is the life of the city. It's so critical. We need benches, and we need trees, and we need lights. The sidewalks are really, the sidewalks remind us that walking is much more than walking. Last month I was working in Buenos Aires and I saw people dancing in the sidewalks. It was, you know, the sidewalks are almost part of the family of the parks. That's why we should say Markham, since it is the most important infrastructure, and given the fact that walking is good for physical and mental health, improved environment, mobility, recreation, in Markham, a two-word law, pedestrians first. So that when anybody has an application to the Department of Planning, first question is, how will this impact pedestrians? I mean, if we're going to improve walkability, for example, we need to lower the speed. All of the neighborhood streets in Parkham should be 30K or less. Why 30K? Because if you get hit by a car at 30K, at, there is 5% probability of being killed. At 50, is more than 85. And there are many, many stories that show the same. Also because we need people to walk. Anybody here from public health? Oh, po thank you. Public health, they should be an allies. I mean, we need to work together, all departments. I'm so happy that we got people here from the library, from public health, from planning. The libraries are one of the most fantastic institutions that have reinvented themselves in the last 15 years. You know, 15, 20 years ago, everybody said the libraries are going to disappear because now everybody has all the books in the iPhone and in the... They reinvented themselves. And now they are as popular as ever. Public health. This is about public health. We need to walk. We need to walk to the library for physical health, for mental health. But when the car, we don't like to walk when the cars are going by at 50 or 60 or 70. We like to walk when the cars are going slow. Also, we go differently. When we walk on a street where the cars are going fast, we also walk fast, if we are there. On a small street, we go slower, we enjoy, we see someone, we talk to them. And there are many, many studies that show the same. I mean, when you are going at a slow speed, that is the view that you have. At a faster speed, it's very, other, uh, 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 very different. So it's an issue of life or death. I mean, these are not technical issues. If we put a small, a small island on the crosswalk, we eliminate more than half of the incidents. Why are we still doing crosswalks without an island? Every single crosswalk in Markham should have an island because we're going to save lives. All of them, the kids are going on a field trip. They don't cross in one traffic light, so they cross on a second one. This is something that should be absolutely mandatory.
And older adults, even more important, because the older adults are killed three times as many as the proportion of the population when there are no islands. And some people now are saying, oh, you know, let, 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 let's even have shared street. No, we always got to think of the most vulnerable person. Do we want to have these shared streets and have these kids negotiating? I mean, of course, sustainable mobility is not just walking. It's also riding bicycles and using public transit and new uses of, of, of cars. Look, imagine Markham like this. I mean, Markham could be as good in cycling as Copenhagen. Why not? You know, one of the things that I find that Markham needs is to be bold, to be ambitious. Because all of a the sudden they say, oh, Markham is good. I think the other day I was with the people of Burlington, Ontario, and McLean said that they are the best community, the best quality of life in Canada. I told them, I mean, put your hand in your heart. Do you really think you are the, have the best quality? I said, but in any case, now they're very proud. So they put in the homepage, oh, the best community. I said, it would have been better if McLean had said you are the 144th, because then everybody would be concerned. How can we improve? But when they tell you you are the best in Canada, so tell anybody that if they love Markham, don't give you any awards, because then people become complacent, and then they don't want to change. For example, cycling. You could be as good as Copenhagen. Why not? I think that Markham should think, OK, which cities around the world have similar population, similar income level, similar weather? Okay, and benchmark with those. Which have the best quality of life? Which one is where the children are the happiest? Where the older people have, are the, are, have the most enjoyable life? Where mobility, where the quality of air, where the tree canopy? I mean, on any measure that you want, benchmark with the best. Of course, Markham is good. If you want to look at cities that are worse than Markham, in 10 minutes, you do a list of 100, or you do a list of 500 cities. But if you compare yourself with cities that are worse, eventually, you're going to look like those. No, benchmark with cities that are better. For example, this is how you could be biking to work. You know, Copenhagen, the weather is horrible. It's cold in the winter. It's hot in the summer. It rains all year round. But nevertheless, they bike. Not one or two, 41 out of 100 trips. In the downtown, 60 out of 100. But citywide, 41 out of 100. And they're not happy with 41. They want to go to 50. And men don't need shirts in the summer or women's special shoes. But they, even though they're really good, they continue to improve. This is the new wave of, of bike sharing systems that all of them have GPS to get. And many of the bikeways are being doubled in size and improved and being widened. And now they got all of these green lanes that all the traffic lights are at the speed of the cyclists, not at the speed of the cars, and new bridges. And they continue. Look, I, when I took this photo at 8.53 in the, in the evening, 16,000 cyclists have gone down. This goes to zero every night at midnight. 16,000, and you can see the, the snow and the ice. And, and so this is how people move. So when you are going to increase by 50% the population in Markham and the York region, it would be nice if you had a goal like this. And it's not how Copenhagen is going to be 30 years from now. It's how they are already now. Why not? Why not? If you really believe in sustainability, financially, environmentally, in health. I mean, Toronto, less than 3% of the people bike. And one of the reasons is that a person driving hits a person on a bike every seven hours. So we gotta have clear priorities. And it's not, when we, if we wanna improve bikeability, it's not about painting shadows on the streets that no one is gonna respect, or bike lanes just put paint, or even getting bike share systems. That is like getting the saddle before the horse. If it's not safe for an eight-year-old and for an 80-year-old, it's nothing, nothing. Don't even call it a bike lane, it's nothing. So any infrastructure for bicycle or for anything, we should always think of them. For example, look at these sidewalks. The sidewalk continues at level. You know, so in all these small intersections is the car, the one that has to slow down when it's going to make a right turn because it's going to go over the pedestrian space that is the sidewalk. So the pedestrian continues. Why is this so important? First, to highlight the importance of pedestrians. Second, because if you are with your boyfriend or your girlfriend and you're holding hands and you go to a sidewalk and you need to go down, you need to stop the conversation. Here, you don't stop the conversation. This little kid is riding his bike. He doesn't have to stop every 100 meters to look. No, the, are the cars thing. In the major intersections, no, in the major intersection, then you stop. I mean, the people in spandex, professionals, they can go around the trucks, but the little kids, they cannot. 
That's why even if you paint colors on the bike lanes, it's not enough. I mean, we need to think of immigrants that come from places where they don't bike. I mean, just do in front of City Hall. Do on one side of the street a protected lane, on the other side, nothing. And then they do a survey. I mean, if we want people to bike in Markham, there are only two things that will increase. Only two things. Lower the speed in the neighborhoods and create a network of protected bikeways. Nothing else. So everything I said about 30K for walking is the same for cycling. So we need to do a grid of AAA bikeways. What's AAA? It's for all ages and abilities. It's not for the 20 to 15 spandex. It's for all ages. But nothing as important as connectivity. Sometimes cities do one bike lane and say, let's see if it works. Toronto does two kilometers on blur and say, let's see if it works. Well, if it doesn't connect anything with anything, it's not going to work. If you do two kilometers for cars and there is no more roads for cars, who's going to use it? No one. So we need a network. We got to think of daytime and nighttime. We got to think of the people opening the doors. And if you don't have the money or the resources to do it permanent like this one in Paris, don't just paint a line. This is, you, this is like when the cities do what is really, really difficult. Get the space. But don't just do that because people are not going to use it. Get that space and enhance that painted line. Even put those plastic bollards every two meters and it's going to make a world of difference. So it's not about doing bike parking or classes or whatever. It's about that. That's why people bike in Copenhagen, because there is connectivity. You know, in Seville, they used to have only three bike lanes, and no one used to bike because they were not connected. They did 150 kilometers and went from half a percent to seven and a half. Now they want to go to 15. But it's not just about walking or cycling, also public transit. Someone said a civilized city is not the one where the poor have cars. It's what the one where the rich use public transit. So we might need buses, we might need trams. Also, we need the connectivity. You have seen the go, how Metrolinx, for example, is building all these horrible parking towers all over the place. $40 million each. $41 million. You know, what is the problem with this? That, that Metrolinx is creating a huge traffic jam in all the GO stations because now they got a thousand additional cars coming in between 7 and 8 a.m. and leaving between 4.30 and 6.30 in the afternoon. Why not put those 41 million into local transit so that actually people can get to places? I mean, we need to improve the local transit on how to get, because if you're going to have to have a second or a third or a fourth car in your home just so that someone will get to the go, then that public transit is not making much sense. And it's not just about infrastructure. For example, a mayor told me that his people didn't like the buses. So what did he do? He got the buses, he put a nose, he covered the wheels, and now they look like trains. So maybe that's what the buses in Markham could look like. You know, some cities do something horrible. They cover the windows. This is horrible. I've never seen a private car like this. Why do we think that people using public transit like it? Also, this is not safe. Safety, we need the people inside to be able to look outside, and the people outside to be able to look inside. Do sell advertising, but don't cover the windows. And especially don't cover selling cars, <laughs> because then it's very painful. <laughs> You know, part of this is democracy. You know, the Canadian Constitution, first line says all people are equal. If all people are equal and 80 people are on the bus or on the train, why is it that you are in traffic jams behind cars with one person? You know, public transit is about connectivity and frequency. If you don't have connectivity or you don't have frequency, it's not going to click. When people say, oh, but we don't have too many people, so we don't have enough buses, or we don't have enough people, so we don't have enough fr uh, co frequency, well, if you don't have connectivity and frequency, you are never going to have it. So the chicken or the egg is very clear what is first. And people say, oh, but where are we going to have the space? Well, having the space, do the mobility math. Do you want one of these or 140 of those? Do you want one of those or 145 of those? You know, the issue of democracy that I was talking about. So this, imagine the DVP going into downtown and from end to end, you could go at 100 kilometers an hour, while the others were going at three kilometers an hour. I mean, what makes public transit rapid is not if the wheels are rubber or they are metal, it's if they have dedicated lanes and they have prepaid and, 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 and very few issues like that. You know, for example, the, uh, Istanbul, this one is Guangzhou. Guangzhou, this moves more people than all of the subway lines in China except line number two in Beijing. 
And then you got to improve the public spaces. I mean, walking, cycling, and transit takes up a lot less space. I'm not saying that this is the end of the car industry, but the way we use cars is changing very fast. You know, in Canada, the young people, Canada and the US, the people 16 through 24 purchase fewer cars than in the last 40, than in the last 40 years. It's interesting how it's changing. And of course, now we got electric cars and we got hydrogen cars. And people say, oh, we're going to have driverless cars, so it's going to change everything. Well, who knows? You know, the drawings, they look quite nice. And they say, we're not going to have any traffic jams. As if the traffic jam was the driver. It's the car. <laughs> if we don't change our behavior, things might be even worse. I mean, we're buying a lot of things through the internet. But it, it doesn't get delivered through the internet. And these trucks are not the best in the neighborhoods. <laughs> So these companies are hiring thousands of people on bicycles to do the last two or three kilometers, but they need, it needs to be safe for them to be able to do it. I mean, it can be great or horrible, it's up to all of us. How are we gonna regulate? We might have many, many more cars moving. Imagine you have one car today and you take one kid to one school, one kid to the other school, and then you go to work. Three trips, one car. Well, now we, Driverless cars, you call up one car to take one kid, another car and the other one, and another takes you to work. You might not even own any, but you're gonna be using three cars. So there might be many more cars moving, less cars parked. I mean, let's keep in mind that the cities, whether they're electric or autonomous or Uber, they're taking up the same space. We gotta create parks for people. I mean, we gotta create, I mean, the parks are great if people visit, they stay and they return. It's not if they win awards. Let me give you some symptoms of parks and public places. You got a public place, one symptom is good places to sit. This guy needed five chairs to be happy. <laughs> On a bench, he needed his feet, his Big Mac. Sometimes people see monkeys see, monkey does. Sometimes it's people. People see, people do. <laughs> we do sidewalks and we don't put benches on the sidewalk. Actually, we even put nails so that young people won't even sit. This guy was so tired that he ended up sitting on his briefcase because there were no benches, while his friend actually fainted. <laughs> and his wife is sitting on their baby. <laughs> but if you have good places to sit, it's kind of magical. This woman in her 80s is reading in the middle of the winter. All of these people, uh, they, they, with movable chairs, they don't even sit facing each other. They sit facing others. Starts to rain and they won't even move. The other day I was working in Istanbul and I see these people sitting on bollards. When it's ironic when they got like 20 chairs in there. <laughs> Another symptom, sociability. If you go to the public places and you see people talking to each other, that's really a good symptom. Another diversity, when we see children, we see youth, we see all the adults, we see people with disabilities. Another symptom, affection. You are affectionate if you feel at ease, if you feel safe. Another symptom, high proportion of women. Women are more selective. If the place is not clean and safe, they are not there. So those are symptoms. But you know, the biggest problem that I see in parks in Canada, not, not especially in Markham, but everywhere, is management. Cities tend to think that management and maintenance is the same. It's very, very different. They're not synonymous. Maintenance, picking up the garbage and cutting the grass, might be 20%. Of course you need to pick up the garbage and cut, but you need to have grandparents and grandchildren doing bread. You gotta have uses and activities. People are walking and running and cycling and playing chess and having lunch and taking a nap. Is the, you need to, management is having volunteers by giving them the tools. Management is going to the citizens before, during, after. Ask them what is it that they want. Management is taking children to the park to help you do vision in sessions of the parks. It's about having resources, human, financial, physical. It's about having equitable access so throughout Markham there will be really nice parks and not just in some areas. It's about having the uses and the activities. It's about safety. But don't do this that I saw in London, England. You know, beware of the thieves. <laughs> this is like an open invitation to all the thieves. You need in the public places police when they're empty. You don't need when there's lots of people. Sometimes I go to the cities and it seems easier to find a million dollars to do parks than to find a few thousand to make it work. The lowest cost to have safe parks is to have uses and activities. We need to have budget. I said, let's do a move in the park. We don't have budget. Let's do walking groups. We don't have budgets. Let's do knitting groups. You know, one of the fastest growing activities in the parks is knitting. You know, 
People could be knitting at home. Why do they knit in the park? It's to socialize. And that is something that people are also doing in the libraries, knitting and socializing. The issue of loneliness is critical. Let's keep in mind, empty parts have very few benefits. So we gotta have, sometimes management is invisible. You don't know, but someone gave him the permit to sell the flowers or to do the laughing yoga. Should we do it in Markham Small or large parks? We gotta do both because they satisfy very different needs. We need to have neighborhood parks everywhere. They develop a sense of belonging. That's where we meet our neighbors. The neighborhood park is critical, but we're not going to be able to play soccer or tennis, so we got to have medium-sized parks. And we're not going to be able to go canoeing, so we are going to have to have the large parks as well. I mean, here you got the Rouge Park. Amazing in Markham. You know? How many have gone to the Rouge Park? Oh, most of you. Fantastic. You know, it, it's amazing. You know, the Rouge Park, so few people really know it. This is more than 20 times Central Park, New York. And it's uh, uh, really something that we got in the heart of our city, over seven, almost 8,000 hectares. And we got, an, it's amazing all year round. And it's gonna be more and more amazing all the time. And it was the citizens and the municipality and the provincial government and the federal government all working together. And now it's being managed by Parks Canada. It's the first urban park managed by Parks Canada. So we need a citywide park system with small, with medium, with large, with active, with passive, with contemplative. Everybody learns from everybody. One, one really good symptom is that around the world, roads for cars are becoming parks for people. This is exciting. Look at this. Here there used to be a river going through the middle. And 40 years ago, someone, you know, 40 years ago, people said efficiency, efficiency. So they put a road on top of the river. Horrible. And then they said, can we go to Markham and get the best people from Markham to come and live here? Probably not, right? So someone eight years ago said, hey, wasn't there a river going down? And they brought it out. Why is this so important? Because Markham, you're going to grow by around 50% of the population, no matter what. But who are you going to grow with? You know, we live in an ever more globalized world. And in a globalized world, the best people, they can live anywhere. However you define best. It can be the best medical engineers. It can be the best pizza makers. If I'm a good carpenter, I can live anywhere. So where am I going to live? Wherever I have the best quality of life. Quality of life has become the most important tool of economic competitiveness. So everybody in Markham must, every morning should be waking up thinking, how can we retain our best people? How can we attract? I mean, the extended GTA, we're going to go by 50%, no matter what. But are we going to grow with the cream of the crop, or are we going to grow with the leftovers? Because it can be, some are going to go some places, some others are going to go others. And this is really critical. These are not going to get the cream. That's why they turn into this. You know, quality of life. Look at these thousands of, of condos here in Copenhagen. It was six lanes for cars. They decided, no, the four lanes in the middle, let's do one and a half kilometers of linear park. One and a half kilometers, magnificent. You know, that's what's happening all over the place with the highways. That's Portland from highway to park. Can you imagine that in Toronto, as we speak, they're taking down a highway and rebuilding it 100 meters for one and a half billion dollars. One and a half. It's going to cost Torontonians $400 for each man, woman, and child. And according to the mayor, is so that 2% of commuters, 2% will save three minutes. So best case scenario, 2% will save three minutes. While we have one out of four children live in poverty, while we have uh, over 100,000 people on wait list for housing, and this is what's happening around the world. They're getting rid of the highways and doing parks. This is Seoul, South Korea. Had a river going through the middle. 60 years ago, they did six lanes for cars on top of the river. It got full. So what do they do when it gets full? They say, let's do a second floor. The second floor got full. You know, the elevated roads, they get full even before they are built because of something that's called induced demand. When people even announce, oh, we're going to do an elevated highway, people start buying houses and things further out because they say, oh, yeah, today there's a huge traffic jam, but it's going to be solved when they do the elevated highway. By the time they do the elevated highway, so many people have moved away that now is full even before it's open. So the mayor of Seoul, 13 kilometers to the middle of the city, not one, 
13 kilometers. He tore down the second, the first, he brought out the river. He said, no city has some mobility through the private car. He put public transit, and now they got 13 kilometers through the middle of Seoul. It's magnificent. Of course, it was difficult. People said, Mayor, are you crazy? People are not going to stop for coffee, as if anyone at 100 kilometers was going to stop for coffee. Now they stop for coffee because there's only slow lanes on each side and 13 kilometers of linear park and public transit. So it's really interesting to learn from others. That's why I said don't copy, but let's adapt. For example, a physical education teacher in Orange Field, she saw each year fewer and fewer kids were walking to school. She asked them, why don't you walk to school? Because they were afraid of the cars. So when kids were home on the holidays, they came back and Anne was dressed up as a pylon. She shut down the parking lot. No parking lot. The parents were very upset. Initially, the kids loved it. She was a good morning, good morning. Minus 24 degrees. And kids started to walk. And kids started to bike. These are the kind of things that are happening. 880 cities next week. We're going to do four days in Parkdale in front of a school. There won't be any cars in 90 minutes in the morning and 90 minutes in the afternoon. You know, part of it is infrastructure, but part of it is programs. You know, in Beijing, now they got over 2,000 of these gyms, and it's taking place all, now all over the world. In Toyama, Japan, and we've been working with the mayor. So one of the things, he wants to do, create a denser city because they are losing population. So he wants to have, instead of spread out, in the center. And I've been working with Mayor Mori. One of the things he taught me, he said, Gil, whenever you are expected to wear a tie, don't wear it here, wear it on the side. <laughs> because we want people to walk and to bike and to go to the public places and the sidewalks and the parks. So we need to relax the dress code. If women want to wear 10 inch high heels, that's fine, but they shouldn't be expected. If men want to wear ties, that's fine, but it shouldn't be expected. But anyway, what, this, what he's doing, which is really great, is doing a lot of interesting things with older adults. One that I want to highlight is in the parks, people with dementia. Now, people used to have their, their family members locked. Oh, it's because he might get lost. No, no one gets lost. And if they get lost, what happens? They, they will find someone. Now they bring him to this park. And in 8.30 in the morning, and then the family member goes to work. They come back at noon to have lunch with their family member. If they don't find them, no problem, because everyone gets a bracelet with a GPS. So then they look. Two the, every two days that a person is under this green, they double the anti-cancer cells. So again, it's software and it's hardware. Melbourne, when people say cities don't change, Melbourne used to be horrible. Even they made fun of themselves. It would not have been in the top 300 cities. Now it's in the top five any, in any ranking. What have they done? Melbourne is about the, downtown Melbourne is about the size of Markham. They have put public art all over the city. But not art for the 100 kilometers an hour, art for the five kilometers an hour. They've been planting trees. Look at the streets without any trees. You put trees and it's totally transformed. They had all of these laneways that were dark and horrible. And now they're improving. What are they doing with these laneways? Getting the pri private sector to do restaurants, to do art, to do flower shops. And then they say, hey, why don't you do a, a, a restaurant? They say, oh, but it's a laneway. So this, the city is helping them with the seed money. It says, I put in 50,000, and you put the risk. I help you with the risk. And then they are doing all of this that is magnificent, where it's flowers. You know, they had a river going right through the middle, the Yara River, that had all of these factories. Or now they got linear park on both sides of the Yara River. And now it has totally redeveloped for homes and for density with beautiful pedestrian bridges around this and places where people can live and work. No one wanted to live downtown Melbourne. Now everybody wants to live. You know, like, like people here in Markham, people say, oh, no one wants to live in condo. No one wants to live downtown. Well, that you, are, you are proving them wrong, that people do want to live with others, and people do want to live within walking distance. And that's what they did here also when they got all of this. Look, it's, it's amazing what, what, what has been the transformation that is taking place. Sometimes, look at the public space. Sometimes it's small things, such as doing really beautiful uh, street furniture. And I said, do you rent this for a lot of money? They said, no, it's not about the money. We tell people, we are gonna, we're going to rent this so you sell flowers. But three things. First, if you see anything illegal, you got to tell us. Second, you got to keep clean the area. But third, you, we're going to give you minimum hours. You can be 24 hours, but we're going to have a minimum. Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, you got to open no later than 7 a.m. and close no earlier than 8 p.m. Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, 24 hours. Why 24 hours? Because they said, you know, if 
at the time when people come out of the bars or whatever at one, two o'clock, they feel safe if every other block there is someone. In one, someone is selling flowers. In the other one, fruits. Maybe you don't buy anything. So it's a win-win because they don't pay, instead of paying $1,000 for rent, they pay only 100 But it's good. For example, I took this fo that photo at noon, this one around 8 p.m., and this one at midnight. So it's about management the public space. So that is good for everybody. You know, and thinking about the streets, yesterday the raptors started playing again. Well, they show us how the streets can easily become public places. You know, the 880, a month ago, this is in Danforth. This was a street that we did a pop-up to show what it would look like just for, uh, for three days. And then it was closed, and then people could come and see and experience, and it, it, that, that is something. And I know some of you are already in the back of your eyes saying, Gil, you don't know that winter is coming. Yeah, I know that in Markham you got 20 horrible days. <laughs> this girl knows it. And you got another 60 that are not very good. But you got about 200 that are nice. You know, one of the problems in the city is that we focus on the 20 horrible days, and then we mess up the 365. You know, sometimes we do some gigantic vacuums that they suck the life out of the cities, such as the underground path in Toronto. This is horrible. This has life two hours in the morning, two in the evening, Monday through Friday, nothing the rest of the day, nothing Saturdays or Sundays. These places, they don't integrate. They totally segregate. They don't want young people in skateboards. They don't want poor people. They don't want older people if they don't have money. And some cities do it above ground, you know, like Calgary or Minneapolis, and where the only life in the building is the, norm, the name they put on the walls. I mean, if we have winter, of course, we need infrastructure. We gotta have better infrastructure. But let's focus on the 200 nice days. And if we focus on the 200 nice days, even the 20 horrible are not gonna end up being as horrible. And people are gonna be able to walk, and people are gonna be able to bike. And when we see these people cycling, we see people of all ages. Sorry for the video, it was one that I took while I was on my bike. But here, is, there's a physical separation. At one level is for the cars, five centimeters higher is for the bikes, five centimeters higher is for the pedestrians. So then it becomes safe for everyone. And of course, there are trees. That's why 41 out of 100 people use their bikes. And you might say, oh, but that's not winter. No, but this is winter. You know, I remember we used to have a mayor in Toronto that said, oh, traffic is horrible because of the cyclists. I said, maybe it's horrible, it's because there are not enough cyclists. Imagine that traffic jam on the right, if each one of these cyclists was on a car. So uh, let's not focus on those 20 horrible. So that's about winter. In the public places, we gotta really improve the public. We need to invest. One of the things that we need for the public places is talk to the people that do the weather reports. Let's say, People doing the weather stop talking bad about winter. We live in cities that have winter, it's part of life. But they start saying, now we're, we're in the end of the October, and they already said, oh, winter is coming out. Oh, it's horrible. Oh, are you, are you going to live to you're gonna go to Florida? Oh, lucky you that you go to Florida. What? Why well, lucky? I mean, if you don't like winter, don't do the weather in Toronto and Markham. Do it, go, move to Arizona. <laughs> It's maybe they get more people watching the news when they talk so bad. You know, in January, they say, oh, even if the, if the day is gonna be nice, they say, oh, tomorrow's gonna be nice, but two weeks from now, it's gonna be horrible. I said, you know, you don't even know what's it gonna be like this afternoon, and you are telling me how it's gonna be two weeks from now. I mean, let's be neutral about the weather, unless there's something horrible happening, but if not, let's be neutral. You know, it's gonna snow, wonderful, let's go out and play with the snow, and you know, it's gonna be, it's like God painting the earth, all of the sudden things are in one color, it snows and it's in another color. I mean, let's work on the public spaces and let's do, but let's not, not just do the ice skating. If we do the ice skating, but we also put lights and music and hot chocolate and beaver tails, let's take, take some of the streets and, and let's use them for hockey. Let's organize yoga and tai chi, and let's do movies in the park. I mean, people are gonna go, but let's make it really fun and exciting and great. And it's, it's totally doable. You know, this, I, I took this in Winnipeg, the river freezes, and then, and then they got a lot of areas where people go inside just to warm up a little bit and then put in colors and sound. And you know, sometimes people are more concerned than the cold, it's about the darkness. So let's put a lot of lights all over Markham. You know, it's not politically correct to talk about the lights and say they're, they're Christmas lights. 
lights. No, let's call them winter lights. And right after uh, you know, October 31st is Halloween, right after Halloween, let's put the winter lights. So we have November, December, January, February. And it's gonna be, all of this is about the benefits. This is not about public spaces or sustainable mobility. It's about creating a market that is vibrant and healthy and exciting for everyone. And these are the benefits. When we have really good public places, it's going to be good for culture, for education, for recreation, environment, transportation, health. Sometimes people say, Gil, should we appeal to the elected officials or to the citizens, to the hearts or to their brains? I think this is like the chicken or the egg. But to me, it's very clear. We need to tell citizens and decision makers, it's about the heart. What is the heart? Any of this. So when you don't tell them about cycling. Talk to them about why it's good for health. Don't tell them about the parks. Tell them about why parks is good for recreation. Don't tell them about uh, uh, parks uh, or sidewalks. Tell them about culture. Once you convince them, whatever matters to each one, each person has different interests, then they can easily get the numbers and then heart and brain are gonna work together. Let me give you an example. Health and wellness, because we need to have like 10 different cards in our pocket with different benefits. The benefits to health, is this what the future looks like? I think the issue of obesity is that it costs billions and billions and billions because this is about heart attacks and respiratory problems and cancer and anxiety and so on. Look, and these are the top 35 countries in the world. Canada is way below. Of course, we're not as bad as the US, but we, are, we should be on the top and not on the bottom. We gotta improve the school lunches. We gotta have farmers markets all over Markham. 52 weeks of the year, even in the winter, let's do it inside gymnasiums and community centers. Let's do urban gardening everywhere. It doesn't make sense that in many places you want to do a small allotment garden in the park and you got to have a wait list like for five years. No, let's have allotment gardens everywhere. Let's have in the libraries. Libraries, you know, part of the reinvention of libraries is that libraries now, before you couldn't talk in the library. Now, you cannot be silent. They are silent rooms. But also the libraries are taking care of the area around it so that people can have allotment gardens and people can do other things. I mean, everything that is public, we need to be really smart before they wouldn't even talk. Sometimes I, I saw in many places in Ontario where, where they would build a brand new school next to a library with a mediocre library in the school. Instead of saying, no, let's put a little bit more money and let's make even better library, Everything that is public has to click. The library and the school and the park and the sidewalk and the street, everything that is. So, you know, we gotta be active. If we're active, it's gonna be help the premature death, the stroke, the osteoporosis, the high blood pressure. I mean, it's not about doing marathons. Great that this weekend, over 40,000 people running the Toronto Marathon. But it's not about marathon. It's about 30 minutes a day for adults, 60 for children. So there's an urgency of being active. People keep, when you look at the magazines in the drugstores, everybody's looking for a magic pill. There is no magic pill. No magic pill. You know, the only way that in Markham people are gonna be physically active, the only way is if people walk or bike as a normal part of everyday life. That's why I'm also talking so much about walking and cycling in combined with public spaces. Because it's the only way, there is no other way. By the way, also, all of the, the parks and the public spaces and the mobility improves physically, but there is no health without mental health. Issues such as loneliness. It's a huge, huge crisis around the world. I was talking a little while ago about with some people from, from libraries. Libraries are about, uh, are about uh, loneliness. Parks are about loneliness, sidewalks. You know, the other day I was in a city in the US and I walked for 10 blocks with the mayor and there was not one bench. And I said, Mayor, we have walked like eight or 10 blocks, there are no benches. And he said, Gil is the homeless. And I said, what, Mayor, is this magic? You take out one bench and a home shows up? I said, you take out the bench, you not only hurt the homeless, now the homeless is gonna sleep on the, on, on the sidewalk. But you are hurting all the elder people. Elder people will not walk if there are no, no benches. So we, we gotta work in all of this. I, I, the issue of loneliness is something that is critical. The UK created the Ministry of Loneliness last year. Loneliness increases, doubles the possibility of dementia. I mean, depression was the leading cause of disability. And if we have contact with nature, we're talking about in the public places, putting nature, putting trees. When I, well, last year I donated 10 days of work in Puerto Rico, I loved those bike lanes with nature all over the place, trees and green everywhere. 
And when I've been working in, that was in Alaska, or also in Minnesota, it's, it's the, we gotta have trees, not only because it looks nice, but because if we have green spaces, it's gonna be good for everybody. Look at this Singapore, a parking lot, but with lots of trees, the parking lot. Even the bike parking has got green, and the sidewalks have green. We gotta have green everywhere. I mean, the green neighborhoods are going to lower the depression, the anxiety. That's why we need to have green in our homes, on the sidewalk, on the schools, on the places of work. We got to have green everywhere. And it's not just for the summer and fall. It's got to be also for the winter. We got to open the parks. We got to have nature everywhere. Seven, let's work on equity. I'm talking about equity and not equality. You know, don't want to do a cartoon that explains this is equality. No, some people are starting so far behind that some need two and three boxes. So they don't need any box. And someone said, oh, that's equality, that's equity. Maybe this is reality. It's even worse. <laughs> but maybe, Markham, you are smarter. And you say, no, we think outside the box. Maybe it's not about moving boxes. Maybe it's taking down the wall. But we are not doing very well. Look, this is the ch children living in poverty. This is the US and Canada. This is South Korea. This is uh, Denmark. I mean, maybe in Markham, you should say, I don't care what Canada is. But in Markham, we're going to look more like the South Korea, one out of 16, than Canada, one out of six. Toronto is one out of four. Mobility and equity is so important. You know, the people that have a car are spending one out of five dollars on mobility. The cars are very, very, and this is according to the Canadian Automobile Association, that they are promoting cars. And even they say, one out of five dollars. And that's without even where to park the car. People buy a house, and one third of the house is for the car. You know, so many people are asphyxiated. No wonder many millennials now are smarter and say, I'd rather, instead of having, the car used to be the status symbol. Now it's more of a status symbol, I don't have a car. I'd rather pay higher rent and live in a walkable neighborhood. So the town center that you're building in Markham is right where people want to go. You know, if people don't have a car, they, they, instead of spending 20%, they will spend only 4% using public transit and walking and cycling. So nothing you can do that would have a higher impact than allowing people to downsize from two cars to one or one to zero. And great for the economy, because instead of building cars built in China or Mexico, now they're going to spend it in the local economy of Markham, in the restaurants, fixing their gardens. You know, we should evaluate communities. It's how do we treat the most vulnerable citizens? Who are the most vulnerable, the children and the elderly? But in addition, if people are poor, or if people have disabilities, or people have a, come from a racial minority or ethnic minority, or in many places are women. So th this should be how we should evaluate in Markham and any other community. I mean, we, when you are redoing Markham, and this town center and all of this, it's not about creating a Disney world for the wealthy and healthy 20 to 60. Like some cities are starting to look like that. Parts of New York are like that. You know, some parts of Toronto are starting to look like that. We really got to work on this. It has to be about everybody, from zero to 100, rich, poor. Oh, you are not 20 to 60? Oh, go live somewhere else. Oh, you are not wealthy? Go live somewhere else. You know, so, so what is the role of each one of us ar around these issues? It, it's really critical because everybody needs to participate. I want everybody to live as a guardian angel of the gentle majority. Who's the gentle majority? The ones that are not the squeaky wheel, the children, the older adults. Let me give you one example of each one, the children. Imagine Markham with playability everywhere. When you come out of this room and people are going to have swings on the sidewalks of Markham. You are waiting for the bus stop and there is a small parkhead. This is not about money. It's about opening our minds and le letting a little bit of creativity flow and do activities. And this is totally doable. We got to have those children playing everywhere at home, on the sidewalk, on the school, on the shopping centers, on the bus stops, on the Viva. And what you're going to say, oh, it's fun and games. It's fun and games, but it's much more than that. Playing is how children learn. Plain is how children develop their muscle strength, their cognitive thinking, their sociability, their sense of belonging. They develop their friendship. Almost everything that children need, need in life, they learn when they are playing. So let's have in Markham parks everywhere. And let's focus on the little kids. For example, we work with Urban 95. What is Urban 95? It's 95 centimeters. The average height of a three-year-old. Sometimes I go to cities and I see so parks for everybody, but nothing from zero to five. So even just get a stick, 95 centimeters, and get on a knee and look. What does the park look like? We're going to focus on those zero to five. I mean, we know that's the most important age in life. 
However, we don't do almost anything for them. We, that they should be our top focus. These kids are gonna be the future city builders. Sometimes we do magnificent dog parks. It looks like we know much more what makes dogs happy than what makes children zero to five happy. We gotta change. And so we should have a goal in Markham that everyone should have a park within 400 meters, within a 10 minute walk. So let's do the parks and it, it is totally doable. And if we don't have a park, let's think of the schools and the libraries and the sidewalks and everything that is public. You know, let's go to the schools and say, that horrible thing you call playground is not a playground. Let's make it a real playground. If and only if you make it a school park, that during the school time is only for the school. But after school, Saturdays, Sundays, holidays, why so much green, green, green roofs, green trees? Because when they play in green, it reduces the attention deficit and hyperactivity disorder. And this is, can be done. The, 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 the schools and the libraries, they gotta be community hubs. And if you don't have a school or a library, then take over a street and make it a play street. But we gotta have, and I said an example of children and one of all their adults who are living longer, no longer, much, much, much longer. And people are having fun and are doing gardening and having ice cream and enjoying their grandchildren. And the population over 16 Markham is gonna double. And over 80 is gonna quadruple. Half of the people that are being born in Markham today, half are gonna live over 100. And that's fine. People are not even thinking of retirement. People are thinking it's more about how to re-engage, how to be active. We should have like citizens alive. Citizen, what is citizen alive? Something that we want to work on telling people, hey, wake up. You know, the biggest waste of resource that we have are the older adults. People retire and we cross them out as if they had died. <laughs> yeah. Except that they got 20, 30, 40 years left and they have experience and they have knowledge. And they, and they are healthier, and in many cases, wealthier. You know, and they can be so productive to the community. They could be teaching English to refugees. They could be tutoring kids in the schools. They could be organizing activities for older adults in the libraries, in the parks, in the sidewalks, in the streets, everywhere. Our universities, Sheridan College here, should have 30% of the classes should be for older adults. Older adults are hungry, but of knowledge. They wanna learn about gardening and sociology and history. You know, in Canada, we doubled the life expectancy in the last 150 years. So we learn how to survive, but when we still have all of these issues of climate change and public health, we need to learn how to live. And learning how to live, that's what public spaces is about. Because a lot of this is about the built environment. So we gotta work on the built environment, but also on the uses of that built environment. We did a study for Canada and the US. The young people, six, zero to 18 is, are about 20% of the population. But they are almost twice as much the users of parks. The older people, the over 60, are also about 20%, but at only 4%. They don't use the parks. Why? Because there's almost nothing to do for older people. So we gotta work. For example, walking. Every single park in the market should have a walking path. Everybody walks. The number one activity in parks anywhere in the world is to walk. Even if it's a small one like this, in front of a library in Singapore, look, that is the library, and they got this walking path, maybe like 400 meters. And it has a small sign, welcome. And then you go, you go and says one lap, 400, two. And then people go home and say, oh, I did 1.6 kilometers. Oh, how do you know? Because there was a sign. And then people come and they go and they tell their family. And this is the size of a basketball court. Half of it has games for children, half for adults, and it has the walking path around there. And it's not just people wanna walk. We also wanna do gardening or knitting or reading or dancing or bird watching. It's about the activities. And of course, infrastructure, we need the benches and we need the walking paths, but also we need game and restrooms and drinking fountains. We know what needs to be done, but we need to make this a priority. And let's work on the intergenerational. Now I have a big powerful reason for the intergenerational. My only grandchild. But it's kind of magical. But every, whenever we do a playground, let's do a nice cozy area for grandparents and for parents. So that when you go with your grandchild to the park, but if there's not a place to sit, then you play for a few minutes, you get tired, you go home. But if there's a nice cozy place to have a coffee, to read a book, to socialize the issues of loneliness, then all of a sudden it's gonna be a magical public place for everyone. So I wanna ask you to let's fight ageism. What is ageism? Ageism is discrimination by age. Sometimes we say, don't do this, why? Because you are a child. You know, in elections we say, oh, don't even talk about politics because you are too young. <laughs> don't do that, you cannot do that because you are old. By the way, uh, bad news for some, good news for others. This is the level of happiness. You know, happiness, the happiest time in their lives 
are shadow and old days. <laughs> so you are in your 20s, 30s, 40s, oh my God. But eventually it's gonna get better, don't worry. <laughs> Some people say, oh, but we have things for older adults. We have this for people with Alzheimer. Well, less than 10% of the people get Alzheimer. The other 90% get anxiety of Alzheimer. <laughs> <laughs> You forget some people's name and say, oh my God, I'm getting it. Oh, where are the kids? Oh, I'm getting it. You know, ageism is dumb. Ageism is prejudice against our children, against our parents, against our own future selves. I mean, aging is not a problem to solve. It's not a disease to cure. Aging is living. So let's celebrate, let's fight ageism. And the last message is, we gotta change, obviously. Change is hard, that's why we don't change. Doing more of the same is easier. Let's learn from how libraries have reinvented themselves. Let's learn how some people have reinvented and created sidewalks and safe crosswalks. You know, in Copenhagen, they didn't have pedestrian streets. The car was taken over in the 50s, 60s, 70s. Where they were gonna do the first pedestrian, they said, oh, no, 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 we have too many cars, and the weather is horrible. But the number one reason was, we don't want pedestrian because that's not part of our culture. That's for the Italians because the Italians are loud and noisy and they like to be on the streets. But we are Danish and cold and quiet. Well, let me tell you, those Danish now are more Italian than the Italians. <laughs> they love their pedestrian streets. This is City Hall in Copenhagen. They started, they, they changed 17 parking places to people places. They started with one pedestrian street against everybody as a pilot, and then it was so successful that then another and another, and they have a whole network of pedestrian streets totally interconnected. So when you are gonna change, three recommendations. First, change is not unanimous. Sometimes elected officials say, oh, but there is so, so there are some people have some concern. They will always be concerned. Honestly listen, but then decide. Second, the general interest must prevail over the particular. So in any public meeting, general interest should be the guideline. And third, when you say no to something, you're also saying yes to something else. When you say, oh, let's don't do this park, or let's not widen this sidewalk, you're also saying yes to more obesity, or yes to more depression or anxiety. So part of the change, elections matter. What happened yesterday is important. When it's elections at the municipality, important. Now cities are becoming advocates. There's also activism. Who would have thought when people say, oh, but it's only me, what am I gonna do? Imagine that this little girl thought about that last year when she was 15 in front of the parliament in Sweden. All of a sudden now she has become a star and a few months ago she invited high schools on a Friday and she had over a thousand cities and then last month over seven million people and she has a simple message. I want you to act as if you were in a crisis, as if your house was on fire, because it is. When, when people criticize her, I, I'm reminded of this by Gandhi. First, they ignore you, then they laugh at you, then they fight you, then you win. I think she said in between these two, some laughing at her and then some are fighting, but I hope that eventually she wins. So all of this is not technical. This is not financial, this is about policy, but not about political parties. It's with a big P, everybody needs to participate. We're gonna move from talking to doing. So Markham, you have the opportunity to do something different. You don't need to copy Copenhagen or Toronto. Or the, no, be your own, learn from experiences. Be bold, benchmark with the best of your size and income level and weather, and then do alliances. Alliances are like a three-legged stool. One of the legs are the elected officials at the city, at the provincial, at the national level, the other leg is the public sector staff. It's about the people in planning and public health and the libraries and transportation and economic development. And the third leg is the community, is the activists, is the university, is the business community. And how to get all three legs working together? What is the glue? Is the sense of urgency. Whatever you think should be your sense of urgency, being the healthiest city in the world or being the most fun or being whatever you wanna be, but, but, but you can make it. I mean, when you are working on the downtown, make downtown Markham irresistible so that people say, oh, I don't, I don't need to have a car. I, don't. I mean, once you decide your urgency, then you develop a shared vision and action. And with vision and action, you're gonna have a vibrant and healthier and happy Markham for everyone. So Markham, let's do it now. Thank you very much.